Yes or no? Yes, doctor, we can hear you. All right, good. Um, there are 48 students uh, in class. I, I, uh, to the best of my understanding, we are supposed to be about uh, 80. Oh, oh there, are, there are some people who are more than one in, on the same device. Yes, they are post sharing. Hey, all right. Then that's okay. Yeah. So that means um, we, um, because this 48, um, okay, let's say there are 50, that means there are about 30 people who are still not on. Uh, um, no, the total will always go up to 65. So it's just a few 20 something students. Most of the other still. guys are. Uh, so other are guys around. say eh? yes most guys are around all right okay so um uh, because of uh, uh, bandwidth issues because i'm uh, i'm um, from home yeah, i'm using my local uh, wi-fi here i will largely not use uh, video but um I'm going to open the video a little bit because I'm sure uh, most of you have never seen me. Uh, since most of you came to the university at the peak of lockdown and so we have not been able to interact. And so it, it really feels bad because um, us also it is important that we know you, the students, because in the future we can meet and even we shall not know that you are our student. And even you will also see us, you will not even know that we taught you. So I'm just going to show my face for a moment um, so that you can uh, attach uh, the voice to the face. Next time, in case uh, uh, things normalize and you're able to pass by, then you can say hi, you know, so yeah. So I'm going to just a little bit of the video, but I'm going to put it off when I start sharing the slide. Yes, so- Yes, um, doctor, we can see you. So I don't know if some of you have ever seen such a face on campus during those few days you have been around. I've, I've ever seen that face and that beard. Ah, good, good. So that is my classic beard for the lockdown. And uh, <laughs> yes, uh, to remember, you know, this uh, horrific years uh, of uh, the corona pandemic. Good, I hope uh, all of you are safe and uh, you are reading hard. Uh, these are hard times and uh, my understanding is that it is going to take uh, individual effort to really, really to educate yourself. Um, as the saying always goes, knowledge is power. Uh, knowledge will uh, help you do things which are totally unbelievable. Knowledge will uh, take you far. It will open for your opportunities. So don't wait for us. Um, we if we may do little but you can do more you have uh, opportunities you have uh, at least access uh, to the latest technology internet uh, all these platforms uh, through which you can learn you can learn things through youtube and any other source you can get because these are now the modern times. So it's not like during our time when you had to depend on the teacher, when you had to depend on the few resources in the library. Uh, now you have to learn differently. It's not going to be easy. Even access to the hospital may not necessarily be easy. Yet you have to become a doctor who has to work on um, patients. 
So those uh, conflicts are real, uh, but uh, nonetheless, it is my sincere hope that uh, you people are serious with your studies, you are committed, you want to become good doctors to serve uh, not only um, your local communities, not only Ugandans, but the world, All right? So that said and done, uh, I'm very happy to be with you people. Um, <clears throat> I invite you to this lecture. And uh, my understanding is that you have done many lectures with uh, Dr. Kwesira Golfrey, uh, particular on the anatomy, nomenclature, and so and so on of uh, dentition. So um, today, we are now going to change uh, the gear and we are going to start looking at uh, some of the other topics which we had prepared for you. And uh, in today's lecture, we are going to introduce uh, uh, local anesthesia. All right. So, um, I want to make a simple request um, that we we mute. Yeah, I can see that most of you are muted. That's good. Uh, so that um, we can be able to uh, hear each other. Good. So, um, now, um, yeah, you have seen me. Uh, my name's uh, Wilfred Agbaku, and uh, by profession, I'm a dental surgeon. I hold an MSc in a, a field called experimental oral pathology. And uh, I've been in the mast for the last uh, almost 20 years now. Okay, so um, in essence, I came here almost as young as you people were. And uh, it has been this past several years which have transformed me into my new uh, look. Um, yes, so in... Um, in the dentistry, we have uh, so, so many uh, topical areas which can be covered. Uh, I think by now you appreciate that dentistry is a speciality. It is a very broad subject area um, with a lot of specialized fields within it. Uh, for example, um, you talk about um, Oral anatomy or dental anatomy, uh, you talk about uh, oral medicine, you talk about oral physiology, you talk about oral microbiology, uh, you talk about oral surgery, you talk about orthodontics, you talk about pedodontics, there are implantology, so many, so many uh, fields and the uh, prosthetics and stuff like that. Um, and the others like dental materials. So it is such, even dental public health, yes, dental public health. Um, I'm sure if uh, Dr. Kwesra last week um, highlight, highlighted for you a few concepts in a oral uh, um, or dental health promotion and the uh, disease prevention, things like that. So that, that is just a snapshot. Uh, this course of yours uh, is just one semester, it's one course. 
And it's, um, it, it basically uh, the purpose, the broad purpose is just to awaken your interest in the field, to appreciate the fact that um, um, healthcare to a patient cannot be holistic or complete until you really assess the patient as they are. And also to realize uh, primarily that uh, oral health has a great impact on a person's health. Uh, for example, if a patient has a, a severe oral lesions, they are ultimately going to die just because they cannot feed well. So their nutritional status will be compromised and um, they, they are likely not to uh, boost the immunity because they have lower uh, nutritional intake and stuff like that. So uh, when you become medical officers, when you become, hello, the newcomers, uh, you are welcome, but mute, mute, please. Uh, mute, mute, yes, thank you. Uh, so, uh, I was saying that um, you, are, you are going to become medical officers, you are going to become specialists, maybe pediatricians, maybe anesthesiologists, maybe mental health specialists. It doesn't matter really which field, even public health. So when you are already aware of the importance of uh, oral health, stroke dental health, then you are going to become an advocate. You are going to say we need more dentists. You are going to say this patient needs oral health review, you know? Uh, because um, I know we always do a lot of cross consultation with PID uh, on pediatric cases. Um, a patient can be admitted in PID, but the problem is maybe an infection in the mouth. And that is the simple reason the patient is dying there. And so, or a patient can have psychological problems, but it is because uh, of their oral health. So it, it is completely cross-cutting and uh, it, it is uh, crucial then that you pay attention uh, to the little we are giving you. But as I said earlier, the most important thing will be for you to uh, take the mantle upon yourself, educate yourself, learn more. Uh, so that then you really can become a good clinician. You'll be able to comprehensively attend to your patient. Yeah, the, from uh, practice, from uh, experience, I know, for example, uh, most of the clinical officers, not actually not clinical officers, most of the medical officers who uh, see trauma patients, particular patients with head uh, or facial injuries, uh, I quite often uh, could say that I get a bit disappointed with the care they receive because there are many missed uh, diagnoses. They will miss uh, tears in the uh, oral mucosa, fractures, and so on and so on, uh, because uh, they lack uh, the uh, kind of uh, knowledge and skills to do uh, appropriate assessment of uh, those patients comprehensively. They will look at the big fractures, the ones which are obvious, but uh, things which are not obvious, they are going to miss them. And yet those are the things which are going to complicate the patient's uh, health outcomes. So with that um, brief uh, overview, um, I think we are now going to uh, delve into the matter. So uh, today we are going to, um, this is the, our, learning uh, outcomes and um, we, I hope we are going to stop by around four o'clock and, um, and for today we may cover objective one, two, three. Describe the history, discuss the concept of pain, 
discuss the anatomy and physiology of the trigeminal nerve. The other two objectives, we can uh, discuss them um, in, the, in the next session. Okay. I see somebody was putting up the hand. Um, okay. So basically for local anesthesia, these are some of the issues broadly we are going to cover um, within the next two lectures. Uh, so in the lecture for next week, we can look through the basic pharmacology and then we can describe the anatomy of injection of local anesthesia. Uh, yes, we are going to basically talk about local anesthesia because that is what we can use in the clinic most times. Any other anesthesia we do, I, I think for you it may not be relevant. Um, uh, if within this field, I know, uh, for example, GA, what we use GA, but because it cannot be generally used in the clinic, um, we are looking at the situation where you find yourself uh, in an OPD setting, not with the, there's no theater, there's nothing, you want to help, how do you do it? What is uh, applicable? That is why we only discuss about uh, uh, you have no anesthesiologist, so uh, you don't have the equipment. Yeah, but uh, LA is readily available. It needs simple things, which you can always uh, have access. So, a brief history of local anesthesia. We, we know that general anesthesia was invented a little bit earlier, okay? And uh, this was, uh, introduced by, again, um, a dentist called uh, uh, Horace, Horace Wells, okay, in 1844. Uh, and the reason was simple, because you know dental extractions can be very painful. So he wanted to find a way to reduce anxiety and pain of the patients. Uh, who are undergoing uh, dental extraction. So invented uh, joint anesthesia. And so they will create what they call painless sleep and then they will do their procedures. Now, the famous Sigma fraud, I'm sure in the health psychology you have come across him. Um, the, the Sigma fraud is really quite famous. Uh, the analytic theory, okay, what they call the psychoanalytic theory, the inventor of that theory, is Sigmund Freud. And uh, he was carrying out some experiments with the cocaine, and he realized that it had the local anesthetic effects, okay. Um, now, the first use of local anesthesia in dentistry is attributed to the American called Hasted. Okay, he used it on himself. Okay, he used it on himself. And because it is highly toxic and addictive, so it was not considered to be very safe to be used in, within the clinical setting. And so this um, necessitated the need for other safer um, my internet seemed to have uh, gone off. 
But uh, yes, I, I don't know uh, how far you guys had uh, listened to me. Um, my network, um, as I told you, I'm from home, uh, so it might have uh, this lot. Now, what I don't know is where were we uh, by the time it vanished. Can somebody uh, let me know? Yes, doctor, I can let you know. You can share the screen. Yes, I'm, I'm sharing yes. now. Yeah, that part of the high effects of cocaine is how it stopped here. Oh, it is so uh, the high toxicity of cocaine. Cocaine. That's where you stopped. Yes, doctor. Okay. So I was uh, saying that uh, after that, I said later, uh, the cocaine was uh, um, formulated. It is a derivative of cocaine. However, for it, it lacks the other toxicity uh, effects of cocaine. And uh, its advantages are that it works faster, it's more effective, and it is not addictive. OK? So those are really significant um, characteristics which make it uh, wonderful. OK? Uh, of course, later in the 70s, lidocaine and atacane uh, was now uh, became the most commonly used anesthetics in the uh, practice of dentistry. So, we need to look at pain and impasse contraction because uh, why, why do we use local anesthetics? Uh, the reason is for pain control. And uh, in order to control pain, you need to understand a little bit about impasse contraction. Okay. So, a good thing is uh, you guys have done the physiology of uh, how embassies are conducted, you know, neurophysiology that you have done already very well uh, with the, uh, those of Dr. Namayancha. So uh, I'm not worried. So um, the World Health Organization defines pain as an unpleasant sensation that occurs from imminent tissue damage, okay? The tissue damage may not be, um, you may not see any physical damage with your bare eyes, but there may be some damage, okay? So from a physiological point of view, pain is a warning. It's a warning that there's something not fine with the system. And during dental treatment, patients will experience pain as something unpleasant. So, Therefore, pain will make it impossible for the dentist to do their work correctly. Yeah, I can assure you, there is no way you are going to do your work well when a patient is having what pain. And uh, you are proficient with the pain receptors, and um, just to highlight. Uh, the issues in a nerve impulse transmission will look at things. For example, you, you need to remind yourself about the fact that there is the structure of the peripheral nerve system, okay? Because that's where you are going to experience uh, that sensation. There has to be impulse formation. So it means there's a stimulus and that is stimulus will trigger an impulse, which has to be conducted along the neural uh, networks. There has to be, after the formation, there has to be impulse conduction and transfer. Okay. And the modulation of the impulse. And eventually you will have perception of pain. 
And um, uh, within the orofacial area, there are uh, the nociception uh, receptors, which also play a significant role in uh, the experience of that pain. Doctor, you're not hearing you. The free yeah, nerve endings. Yes, the, the network went off a little bit. So you will be patient. So where it goes off, I will repeat. I yes, hope you are able to hear me now. Yes, we can hear you. OK. So just a revision here, because I know you have done the uh, physiology of uh, these uh, pain receptors and so on and so on. Uh, to remind you, um, I was on point two, which is the free nerve endings uh, that they are sensitive to a variety of, for example, mechanical. Mechanical means that, for example, touch, right? You can touch, and then the person experiences it. Thermal and chemical stimuli. Thermal, of course, is heat, chemical, can be, for example, uh, things like sugar. Mm. Yeah. I, I'm sure um, Dr. Quizra has already told you that uh, uh, when a person has a cavity, they are going to experience sensitivity to sugar. Yeah, so that is chemical. And the... Uh, uh, and these are therefore called the polymodal. So mechanical, you see thermo, chemical, and so on, meaning different models. Then uh, another important point to remind you is that nociceptors do not display adaptation. Okay. So the, the, the responses will occur as long as the stimuli is present. So as long as the stimulus, like the sugar is present, you are going to continue to feel what? That pain. As long as the heat is present uh, on a, a cavitated tooth, you are going to uh, continue to feel. I think this one, you guys can experiment that by yourselves. Mm -hmm. This is a simple experiment to do. And I know many of you have some cavities, so you can experiment that by yourself. Or even with very cold water, Mm -hmm. uh, from the fridge, you can experiment that. Uh, so that's a good experiment for you to remind yourself of the physiology. And also the fact that, um, uh, yeah, uh, those uh, nociceptors don't adapt. They don't say that, okay, I've been stimulated enough, now I'm used more. They will continue to respond. So, um, the detection of stimulus is performed by the receptors present in the sensor nerve endings. So, um, the axon types of these nerves are different, uh, as illustrated here, and um, the and uh, they, they determine the speed of uh, impulse contraction. You can see that uh, the biggest are the A alphas and the smallest ones are the Cs. Okay, they have the tiniest diameters. And so um, it, and that means the conduction there is slow, but Nonetheless, it is still very effective. So the role of pain receptors, okay? Uh, during tissue damage, several substances are released uh, that are able to stimulate the nociceptors 
And these include, for example, histamine, serotonin, bradykinins, prostaglandins, and the interleukins. Okay. So when these are released, they are going to stimulate those uh, nerve endings. And they will activate the nociceptors and reduce their threshold. So creating sensitization. And there is a feedback regulation from the central nervous system. So you should always remember that the central nervous system is the switchboard kind of. And uh, it is important to also note that once pain has been observed, the receptors become more sensitive for nociceptive stimuli. So they become sensitized, actually they become more active, okay? And so this is how chronic pain is what? Created, yeah. So they are kind of sensitized, so small stimulation, then they will keep showing you that there's what? This pain. And the dizziness receptors are present in the teeth and the oral cavity, uh, and the usual are sensitive to a specific neurotransmitter. And I'm sure um, in the structure of uh, the, the tooth, uh, uh, Dr. Quizra uh, uh, must have told you that there's a, a neurovascular bundle in the pulp, okay? And it has the extensions uh, which go into what we call the internal tubules, okay? Uh, that's why when your enamel is uh, damaged or eroded or cavitated, then um, the, the tooth starts becoming sensitive because the enamel for it, it is not innervated, but the dentin is innervated with those very tiny uh, uh, nerve endings, which are lying within sometimes um, having small particles extending towards the neural tubules, the, the, the dentinal tubules. And, uh, and it will create uh, sensitivity and every sensitivity experiences for it, it translates it into pain. Okay. So don't forget that. So, um, then, uh, there is what we call odontoplasts, okay? Odontoplasts also play an additional role uh, by releasing calcium and ATP. And the ATP stimulates the endings of the trigeminal nerves. And the sensor nerve, that system, uh, also contains physiological sensors. These are small end organs of the sensor nerves, such as the crowds, Mesna and the Pacini bodies, okay? Yeah, so uh, you can uh, look more about this uh, so that you can uh, understand their structure and uh, appreciate their uh, different roles. But the most important thing is that these play important roles in uh, identifying uh, issues when they arise. And uh, so, um, in some instances, um, uh, these physiological sensors uh, only respond to specific stimulus, for example, to warmth, to touch, to smell. And so, there they become what we call uni module.
And um, in those kind of instances, when the physiological sensors exhibit phenomenon of adaptation, then the response to stimulus disappears during prolonged or persistent stimulation. Then in the case of excessive stimulation, the physiological sensors may also initiate a sensation. So um, those uh, physiological changes can sometimes happen, but uh, I think the most important thing is to appreciate that um, uh, the stimuli we most times deal with uh, in the teeth. Um, okay, the nervous uh, system, the nociception within the within the neurovascular and the nerve endings uh, within the dentinal tubules, um, it, it tend to behave in such a way that as long as the stimulus is exposed, then you are likely they're going to continue to experience the pain. So some more examples of the physiological sensors. Uh, this is how they look like. Uh, the tactile corpuscles, the laminated corpuscles, and cruise and barb. OK? So yeah, this is just, you don't have to cram anything, but uh, just to remind you how these things actually and like, and you remember these uh, structures, okay? How the uh, stimulus, you know, moved along these ones, and uh, how the nerves end here, and so on. Yeah. So um, this bit is going to be kind of uh, an asset. Uh, I would be I say a task for you uh, to just uh, um, review uh, the process of inverse transmission, uh, particularly the structure of the peripheral now, inverse formation, inverse conduction transfer, modulation of the inverse, and perception of pain. So this is going to be a task for you. So we can uh, um, we can uh, revisit it. Uh, when we have our next uh, class, um, that time uh, I will ask you to uh, let me know uh, what you understand with it, whether you have been able to review your physiology. So um, I'm going to share the slides, but even uh -huh, these slides are already on the learning management system. So you can download it um, and uh, use this uh, uh, slide page 13 uh, for revision. So yeah, that is that that is good. So no deception in the oral facial area. So the issue of uh, the process of transduction transmission modulation and perception occurs as well in the head and neck area. Tooth pain is caused by stimulation of the polymodal nociceptors in the dental pulp and the dentine that respond to mechanical thermal activation and pressure. Okay. And the intensity of the pain is determined by the frequency of the sensory stimulation and by the number of nerve fibers that are excited. Temperature stimulations induce immediate pain responses through the alpha delta fibers. So if temperature in the oral cavity will be, for example, when you are taking tea or when you are drinking cold, uh, uh, water, you know, those refrigerated things. So all that is temperature, it re registers. Cold and the hot is all temperature, okay? And uh, when a tooth is stimulated mechanically, 
fluid moves in the pulp and the, the, the channels in the dentin, which alters the form of the nerve membrane and the stimulus is excited slowly via the C fibers. Okay, so the pressure will cause a uh, fluid movement. So that means it's going to create pressure on those nerve endings. Okay. And uh, after application of something called the stimulus extinguishes after a while because vasoconstriction induces lack of oxygen. Okay. So now we can now have a quick look at the trigeminal nerve uh, because it's uh, fairly key. Uh, it plays a, an important role in what we are interested in. Uh, because uh, the trigeminal nerve contains a large number of sensory uh, that is afferent and motor, which are efferent neurons. The sensor fibers carry nerve embassies towards the central nervous system, while the motor fibers carry embassies away from the central nervous system. And so, um, yeah, you have uh, this anatomy, uh, and you can see some of uh, the nerves running here to the teeth. Okay. Yeah. It coming from, of course, you know, the facial nerve up here. Yeah, and then this component. And um, to remind you uh, that the trigeminal nerve emerges from the middle of the pons at the lateral surface of the brainstem, and it consists of two parts, the sensor fiber um, and the motor fibers. Uh, and these two roots run to the front of the petrous part of the temporal bone, where the large sensor trigeminal ganglion, okay, lies in a shallow groove surrounded by the dura mater, okay. And the nerve provides the sensitivity of the dentition. The mucosa of the mouth, nose, and paranasal sinuses and the facial skin, okay? So you can see that it is really very important for the oral uh, facial area, okay? So without it, the teeth are not going to be sensitive and the oral mucosa, the nose, the paranasal sinuses, okay? And the, the motor fibers innervate uh, parts of the mas masticator muscles. Uh, I know you have not, uh, you have done already anatomy. So uh, in your study of anatomy, jaw anatomy, uh, anatomy of head and neck, I'm sure you have come across the masticator muscles, okay? and you know why they are very important. Uh, so therefore the trigeminal nerve is the most important nerve for the sensory and motor innervation of the oral system. However, the the other nerves, the facial nerve, glossopharyngeal, vagus, hypoglossal are significant, okay? Because they are going to innovate some of the parts 
either of the tongue, of the of the face, and so on and so on. Okay, which are all what maybe we could term the oral region. Okay. And uh, some of these nerves, as you can see, nerve seven, nine, and ten, uh, take care of the test sense, okay, and also provide the general sensation to pain, touch, and temperature of the pharynx, of the soft palate, and the back of the tongue, okay. Yeah, the pharynx, soft palate, and the back of the tongue. And uh, nerve 12, you can see, is uh, responsible for the motor innervation of the tongue. So <clears throat> appreciating the anatomy of these nerves is important. So uh, I will urge that you revise um, the anatomy of these nerves particularly in relation to the oral cavity, how the, the, which structures they actually innervate and so on and so on. You can look at the map um, and it will help you to understand how local anesthesia needs to be applied. Because uh, you want to, when you are uh, applying local anesthesia, you want to eliminate the effect of those nerves. You don't want the, them to detect pain and so on and so on. So it, that's why it is just a reminder that as long as there's going to be a form of innovation, um, the innovation may be sensory, it's going to cause a challenge. So uh, the trigeminal nerve uh, a little bit of the anatomy, uh, it has the three branches, okay, um, the opt optalmic, maxillary, and mandibular, okay. So, optalmic V1, maxillary V2, and mandibular V3. Yeah, so you know uh, that it exits the skull through the foramen of valley. So um, the, this trigeminal nerve is really key nerve. We first within the field of dentistry, we have to deal with, okay? As long as you are in practice every day, it's the kind of nerve you have to deal with almost every other time. Okay, yeah, so because this is the nerve which is going to impact what you are going to do, uh, innovation to the palates, to the lips, um, to the tongue, some parts of the tongue, and to the dentition, to the mandible, and so on and so on. So um, some of the areas which it covers are really as follows. The optamic uh, nerve, uh, you know, carries sensory information from the skin, the forehead, the upper eyelids, and the nose ridge, and the mucosa of the nasal septum, and some of the paranasal sinuses. Uh, the maxillary nerve, uh, nerve skin of the middle facial area, uh, the side of the nose and the lower eyelids, the maxillary dentition, the mucosa of the upper lip, the palate, the nasal concha, and the maxillary sinus. So that means when you lose uh, the maxillary nerve, you have lost uh, innovation to all those structures, okay? 
And this can happen. There are things which can damage these nerves. For example, when you get a fracture, you know, when you get a fracture, there are different uh, fractures uh, of the uh, orofacial area. It can damage that nerve. And um, yes, the mandibular nerve will uh, cover the skin of the lower facial area, the mandibular dentition, the mucosa of the lower lip, cheeks, and the floor of the mouth, part of the tongue. Okay. And part of the external here. So when it comes to local anesthesia, that means now you can know uh, how to deal with the, the uh, process. Okay, you want to do a procedure around the upper eyelids, then you don't have to involve the rest. You know where to anesthetize. You want to do an extraction of an upper tooth, you don't have to involve the mandibular nerve, you leave it alone. You want to do a lower tooth extraction, let's say, um, uh, Four six, then you don't have to involve the maxillary nerve, and because you know that now you only have to deal with the mandibular nerve. Okay, yeah. So um, yeah, that's why it's important to understand uh, the distribution of this nerve very well, and uh, this I give it uh, as a task to you people to revise and then we can, uh, uh, in a quick session next, uh, during our next uh, class, then you can uh, just remind me of some of the things you have reminded yourself of. Okay, so um, yeah, I can see we still have time. So good, we are going to continue with the lecture. But before we continue, um, I want to know um, if there are any questions. Um, yes, if there are any questions, you can put them in the chat room, uh, or you can. Um, Is there any question or hello? I think there's no question and oh, in okay. the chat. Yes, I can see. Yeah, I can see there is no question in the chat. Those yes, late earlier somebody was saying if they, yes, somebody wanted a, um, uh, that I put the slides in a presentation mode. I removed it because I think my computer has a problem. Um, the slides are not moving quickly when I put it on the presentation mode. I don't know why, but uh, yeah. So are you people able to see it now or you are not? We have been seeing it, doctor. If there was okay. a problem, we would complain. Okay, okay. But it's clear in that format. Okay, okay. Because um, if, if when it also doesn't move, it is uh, it, uh, it it kind of drags. It, it yeah. So I don't know the. It could be a problem with the computer. Okay. So if that is just a, a snapshot of a reminder. You can see that uh, you can um, have more detailed lecture on the trigeminal nerve and even the optomic nerve, maxillary nerve, mandibular nerve details. But uh, this is just to remind you 
uh, what these things are, how they are important uh, with what we are dealing with. Okay, so now we can now go and look at uh, something to do with the, the pharmacology of local anesthesia. Because the, the purpose why we are looking at those um, innovation and uh, so on was uh, to remind us that uh, um, when you are dealing with the teeth, you are likely going to have to deal with the innovation as well. Because the tooth can be decayed, okay? And you want it extracted, and how are you going to extract it without uh, causing harm? Harm in terms of, of course, of pain, not, not harm as harm, but in terms of pain. Yeah. So, um, I'm sure uh, now by fourth year, you have also finished the study of pharmacology. Now, this again is not detailed pharmacology. It's just a reminder. It's a reminder uh, that uh, pharmacology is important. You cannot run away from it. So if you thought that you are done with pharmacology, now uh, we are back. But uh, this is just again a reminder, not details. So uh, the pharmacology of local anesthesia and uh, when we look at the molecular structure, uh, basically uh, uh, most of it is a, a lipophilic group uh, can be identified, which determines the lipid solubility. So you see it has to be soluble. And uh, it also contains a hydrophilic group and uh, that uh, will uh, determine the degree of water solubility. Okay. Uh, uh, mostly the lipophilic part of the molecule is an aromatic structure that contains a benzene ring, a benzene ring. And uh, the hydrophilic part contains a secondary or tertiary amine. So you can see uh, its design is to help it to be soluble within the body fluids. You know, the body fluids have lipids, they have water, and so the, the LA has to be able to be soluble. So, um, mode of action. Uh, local anesthetics block the development of an axon potential and conduction in the cell membrane. So as I said earlier, uh, you have to revise those components by yourself, how impulses are generated, how they are conducted. So, but the LA, what it does, it is to block that uh, process of the development of an axon potential, okay? which will move uh, the stimulus to generate its effect like pain and so on. And therefore they do this by inhibiting the voltage dependent increase in sodium conductivity over the cell membrane, okay? The cell membrane. And it is also important to note that local anesthetics bind reversibly, you know, reversibly to both plasma and tissue proteins. They bind primarily to globulins, erythrocytes, and less to plasma albumin. albumin. And uh, two of the LAS we use, Bubuvkin and the Atkin are uh, strong, uh, strongly bound to plasma proteins. And the, that also has an advantage uh, it, uh, uh, that uh, it, they are able to kind of like be sustained and create a lot of uh, effect, you know, over a slightly longer period of time. 
because of the of being bound no uh, locally. Mepivacaine, lidocaine, and prilocaine are less strongly bound. The degree of protein binding is a determining factor for the duration of time of the local anesthetic. Okay. So um, now, uh, lidocaine, uh, we always have a solution uh, how to deal with lidocaine um, because it's the most common we use. Uh, therefore, we always uh, improvise. You know, it is uh, constituted uh, with um, adrenaline uh, to increase the uh, vasoconstriction in the area. Uh, as such, you see the blood will not sweep away the LA, and then its action can be sustained. Yeah, as you can see that it has a poorer binding compared to Bubivacin, okay? Yeah. So how does LA get eliminated from the body system? As I've already said, blood is the main uh, source, it's what uh, the circulating blood or blood coming from the tissues and so on, whatever is being drawn out of the body, uh, body uh, tissues will go into the circulatory system and take away the, the LA. And as such, the site which has a, uh, a high level of vascularization uh, will determine the amount and velocity. If the vascularization is less, then that means um, there is a slow uh, uh, removal of the local anesthesia and then it is sustained much more and much longer, okay? And also if the LA has some characteristics, like if it can cause vasodilation, then you know vasodilation means there's more blood, a pool of blood. But uh, yeah, so uh, it's going to uh, cause a loss, you know, uh, much uh, faster. So it means the LA is going to be eliminated much faster. And its effect will not be sustained. And yet you need it to stay longer so that you can do your procedure. So I've already said that if we are to sustain the effect of LA, you have got to uh, create vasoconstrictors, which will reduce the blood flow. Okay. And, uh, and mostly we use uh, adrenaline. So uh, that said, now, how, how do we deliver LA? We, in the dental practice, we use um, the dental cartridge, but in the absence of dental cartridge, you can use the normal syringes. Yeah, but uh, since you guys are learning dental health, uh, you may come across this uh, uh, kind of things, and then you'll be able to say, oh, this is a dental cartridge. Okay, yeah, this is how a dental cartridge looks like. This is the complete one. This is the top and this is the bottom. And it has this plugger, okay. This is where you press. Of course, it is a, um, a dental syringe, which I'm going to show for you shortly, okay. So inside here is the, the local anesthetic. So these are prepackaged. So it means they come uh, already like in a volume of two meals, which uh, you just put in the dental syringe and then you can apply. Um, of course, you will need the dental needles. 
you can see that the dental needles, just like any other needle, also come in different sizes, different gauges, uh, uh, gauges, uh, these small ones and the long ones. And they are also packaged uh, like this uh, uh, to ensure that they are sterile. So here um, are samples of uh, dental syringes. Uh, this is how they're designed. This is their handle. This is where this part, uh, I hope you are able to see maybe, yeah. This is where you fit uh, the cartridge. And you can see this is one which is being loaded. The cartridge is being uh, uh, fixed through this uh, empty uh, tunnel uh, in this chamber. And then you can uh, retract this handle back and it can push uh, the cartridge inside. So here is um, the picture of uh, a dentist uh, administering uh, a mandibular block. This is what we call a mandibular block, okay? So, um, as you can see, uh, because now the, the patient is facing towards us, um, the dentist is seated behind or standing behind them, okay? Yeah, you can see that the dentist is behind and um, And uh, this you can see is that they are given a left, okay, a left mandibular block. And I think the most important thing is you can see how the syringe is aligned. It is aiming at the angle, you know, at the angle there, the mandibular angle in the it right, right in the recumolar area, yeah, behind there. So, and you know that that's where the the ramas is. You know, the sending ramas. Uh, where your nerve, uh, the mandibular nerve, emerges. You know, out uh, of uh, that bony block. So you want to aim. Uh, that nerve, so that then you can achieve anesthesia of this part, you know, up to the midpoint here, and this side, and parts of this, of the tongue, the lateral aspects of the tongue. Yeah, so just a, a reminder of some of the innovation uh, because it's important. Um, it, it, like you want to anesthetize, you see this is the maxilla, okay? You can see here how the innovation comes out. And so, and so hello, hello, hello. Hello. Hello we are hearing you well. Yeah, but there's somebody talking in the back here. Yeah, just a reminder um, that, uh, for example, this is the maxilla, okay? The maxilla, you can, uh, I'm sure you remember this, uh, the tesson, okay? And the innovation now. And so when we are usually, uh, let's say you want to anesthetize, uh, because we are talking about local anesthesia. So you know specifically what to do. You want to anesthesia, then it means you have to uh, reach this innovation because just like this, 
So it means if you can give a blob here, you are going to reach most of this data. But if you are only targeting this anteriors, then you may not need to extend the anesthesia here. You could as well just block it around here, okay? This is enough to block these ones. And when you do that, then to minimize the discomfort from the outside part, then you have, you have something to block, you know, on the outside aspect from this inferior uh, alveolar nerve kind of, hmm? uh, I mean, this infra uh part of this nerve, which just descends downwards, which is going to innervate the mucosa, you know, of uh, the gingiva and so on. So you want to give an infiltration around here, which is going to minimize uh, a, a, the patient experiencing any pain when you are trying to do a procedure at around it. Because you have uh, innervated here from the palatal aspect, then you are going to uh, innervate from the outside part also to block uh, the innervation from that side. So you can do really a specific um, a blocks, okay? You want to achieve a greater innervation of all this, you can come uh, a little bit here where these nerves exit, yeah? Yeah, so um, then you can give a block here. Uh, and then you are able to achieve a broader uh, uh, numbness. Particularly when you are, you are also interested maybe in doing procedures in the molar area. Yeah, so yeah, this is uh, um, a very nice illustration. You can see the mandibular nerve, okay. And um, you can see the maxillary nerve, how it is distributed, okay? So it, it, then that means you can know that if you want to achieve anesthesia here, you need to block this part, okay? And also on the palatal side, you can also block because you block on the palatal side, you block on the outside part, then you are able to achieve a numbness in these areas, and then you can be able to do an extraction. Okay, good. So um, that is it. Um, unless if we have any question, so we can. Uh, uh, then be able to uh, confirm again next week. And as I said, um, we, when we confirm, we are going to first start by uh, revising if, if the nerve members generation conduction and so on so that uh, uh, all agree that we have revised enough, okay? And um, then we shall, uh, um, then we start uh, next week, then we can look at uh, how do we actually do extractions? Yeah, just simple extractions. We are not going to do any complicated extractions. And maybe a few procedures which are beneficial uh, for the patients uh, in case of uh, orofacial trauma, if that is the interest. So that um, in case you really come across a patient, what do you look for? How do you diagnose that there's a problem, okay? How will you know that there's a fracture uh, of the maxilla, for example? Yeah, 
or how will we, how will we assess the extent of that fracture? So those are the things uh, we should be able to discuss next week. And uh, uh, when we are done with that, then, um, yeah, it's so, I don't know, um, um, Paddy, maybe you can help me. Uh, I want to do a check. Um, Paddy? Yes, doctor. Yes. You have done dental anatomy? Yes. You did the periodontium? Yes, we did periodontal. You did periodontal diseases? Yes, we did. Uh, uh, you did the dental health promotion? Yes, we did that last week. Last week. Uh, you have not done non-communicable diseases and oral health? You have not done infection control in dental surgeries. We did that. You did that. Uh, what about habits, traditional beliefs, and practices? Uh, that one we were given as an assignment of habits, but traditional beliefs, no. Okay, so okay, we shall discuss that, but uh, let's first uh, look at um, how do we do extractions. Maybe how do how do we do diagnosis and a few things, yeah? Yeah, yeah. So that is what we are going to do uh, next week. But uh, before we do that, um, we shall start by revising that uh, uh, just what the task which I told you. But uh, I think these lectures are there on the learning management system. You can actually be able to download them. Are you people able to access the learning management system? Yes, we can access LMS. Yes. So this particular lecture is already there, so the PowerPoint. So you can download it there. And then, because that uh, task, which was on a page, um, uh, let me go there. Uh, this one. Uh, Nerve impulse transmission, the structure of the peripheral nerve, impulse formation, impulse conduction, transfer modulation, and impulse perception. This, you just use this as a guide. Um, not really so much detail, but at least to remind you how this is done, okay? Yes. Yeah, so then, uh, then uh, we can then, uh, if what we are going to do uh, next week, uh, we can look at, uh, uh, how do you take, uh, for example, uh, if, did the, Dr. Quizra teach you how we do uh, history taking, uh, assessment, and so on in the dental practice? Yes, he taught us. He taught you already? Yes, because it was in a He already taught you that? Yes. Okay. So then we are going to look at just some of the... Hello? He just that, doctor. He didn't. He did not, eh? He did he or he did not? He don't. Um, okay, you type it in the chat. He did not. He, he did not, eh? Okay, then that's okay. Um, we, we have time, so we can... That, may, that should be... Um, because that is one of the things which you need to know. Uh, because if you have the patient, how are you going to know? Eh? What are the real practical steps you can actually do to come up with a good impression? Because a person will tell you I have a toothache, but you may be shocked. It may actually not be a toothache. The toothache may not be due to what? A tooth problem. So it helps to really uh, follow the normal standard procedures, eh? So, okay, and then let's do that um, next week. Um, uh, same time, uh, same place, Zoom, eh? Yes, doctor. Okay, good. So, uh, you encourage all the members, let them download the lectures and the, 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 
the be able to revise and the, uh, read more. There are some books which we I think were also uploaded there. You can also have a look at those things. Eh? More details there. Yes. Does the dentist know where to place the anesthesia? I think you talked about it. Maybe also talking about how to bring the anesthesia. Hey, there's a, a chart, eh? Let me check. Yeah. Oh, there are many things on the chart, yes. Um uh okay. Wait, wait there. Uh somebody, let me go through the messages. Uh, yes, okay, somebody said that he, he, he thought that we are not supposed to finish, but it's okay. Um, I realized because I was not asking you people many questions, so then I was able to move faster. And uh, I realized when I'm also on it, when we have for usual face to face, there are many other examples I give. I always ask too many questions. And um, which I which has uh, really created a difference because uh, now I have not asked many questions, and uh, that's why the lecture ended quickly. I, and then I realized, okay, I can actually finish. But otherwise, in the face to face, this is a lecture which I almost did two or three times because there are always many questions. There are always many this and that. Uh, so. Uh, this other one is uh, saying I request the doctor to use more teaching videos next time. Okay, uh, the videos, I don't have to do them because you see, if I do a video here, you can actually do, you can, um, I think yeah, this is Joseph Monge. My suspicion is Joseph Monge came a little bit late. So uh, Joseph, um, videos, I don't have to play them on my, on my Zoom, that would be a waste of data because these videos, I don't actually create them. These videos, you can get them from YouTube. So there are many videos, even we put the links. If you um, go to the learning management system, the links are there, please, you download those videos. So that's why, I, uh, thank God you have reminded me so now I have to remind you that those videos are down the, uh, the links we already suggested. So you can even how to give anesthesia and so on. All those links are down the learning management system. Please, you go there, download those videos from YouTube, watch them, learn how it is done. So um, yeah, I understand. I think you might have come on a little bit late. Uh, those were some of the issues I discussed with the learners who were a bit earlier. Yeah. So because uh, playing a video, that's going to waste my data. And, um, and it's also going to waste your time. After all, that video, I'm, I'm not the one who has created, so it doesn't make any sense. Um, which had... Uh, So, uh, Paddy, um, what what was the question? The, the question was, uh, how does the dentist know where to place the anesthetic? And you what? answered that. Yes, yeah. I think, yes. 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 When I was showing the slides on the, yes. uh, the osteology and the nervous distribution, yeah, uh, yeah. Let me. I I think it was a slide. One of these slides down. Last slides, yeah. Yes, because um, we are talking about local anesthesia. We are not talking about GA. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So these are the slides here. So, if, because now now you know the anatomy, right? Yeah, now you know the anatomy. You know that these nerves come out from this foramen, which are here. You know this is the end of the heart palate. There's this foramen, yeah, the palatine of uh, innervation, which passes here, the greater palatine, 
and somewhere also the lesser palatine. And so you want to block, let's say, uh, this whole patch, then you go here, right? Yeah. 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 So you are, you are able to block the whole innervation, but you remember it is only for the, uh, uh, that is, uh, okay, left side, yes? Now, if you want the right side here, you have to block this one, right? Yes. Yes. And sometimes we do complete exodontia. Complete exodontia means you want to remove all the teeth. So you have two options. One option is either to take the patient for J or you do complete block of all this navigation here, there, and even the bilateral mandibular blocks, then you can remove them. But of course, it's, a, it's a more tedious because you remember the, the patient is alert. Uh, they will be cause new headache. So um, yeah, when you are doing, you are interested in doing complete exposure, you are better off maybe even doing general anesthesia so that you are more comfortable in doing what you are doing, yeah? Yeah, and I said, even because sometimes you are only interested in the anterior, so you don't have to do a complete uh, uh, block here. You can uh, come up here because what you want is uh, maybe a local area, maybe this, um, maybe two one, uh, two two, or maybe one one, you know. So you don't have to do here, you can just, yeah, you don't have to do the whole of it. So you can, uh, yeah? The person who has raised their hand, I think. They can ask their question. Uh, good afternoon, doctor. Thank yes, you. good afternoon. Now, um, the problem, let me first, uh, uh, when you do, you ask me, uh -huh. you are Addison, eh? You are Addison. Hello? Yes, it was Addison. Yes, yeah. Yes, Addison, you can talk. Uh, doctor, you talked about uh, mixing adrenaline with uh, uh, lidocaine. So I wanted to know the proportions and maybe the uh, dosages. Thank you. Um, yeah. So we, because, okay, let's say, uh, Usually, uh, the ratio is uh, almost like a one to uh, 50,000, something like that. Uh, it, but um, it, what I can say is uh, if you have uh, a 10 mil, uh, bottle of uh, lignocaine, yeah? Hello? 10 mil? Yes, doctor. Then uh, you can uh, put in it like a uh, 0.25, uh, okay, because it, uh, if you have one mil, if you have a half mil, you have point. You have 0.25 mils, right? It, 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 that, that should be able to go into like uh, in a, a 20 mil, 20 mil. This is standard lignocaine in bottles. So that's what we, we usually use in the clinic. And um, it, now, um, the amount of uh, LA which we want to use. Uh, you don't want to overdose because you see you can end up overdosing a patient. But um, if the standard is usually two meals, we usually use two meals. Um, sometimes for some reason, two meals may, you might have not achieved anesthesia. Maybe you missed the block, you, yeah. Um, 
the patient is feeling pain, is nervous, then you want to add another one. But uh, usually when it starts exceeding like six meals, then it starts becoming a bit not too good. So you always want the lower amount, uh, maybe two meals, four meals. Uh, that's why it helps to revise the anatomy very well so that you can try your best to achieve anesthesia almost at once. Okay, thank you, doctor. Yeah, welcome. Thank you, doctor. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, that's good. Yeah, so enjoy the rest of the week and uh, let's meet again next week, yeah? Yes, doctor. Okay, okay. If there are any questions, you guys, okay, uh, I know we don't have a WhatsApp group, but uh, you can always uh, email me and so on and so on. Uh, doctor, what is your email? Uh, w. Yes. Uh, no? uh, yeah, W. Back at mask. Dot S. Dot U. G. Okay. Yes. Okay. Good. Wonderful.